All right, so CEDA Invites, uh, just briefly, is a, a series of uh, hosted conversations about research, performance. Uh, it's really is about uh, opportunities to share things that are going on in, in the world of dance and performance, dance, movement and performance, and to try and create dialogues. Uh, this particular series that uh, this afternoon is part of is called The Body and AI. I'm actually going to just drop the link into the chat. And this series has been is really about trying to investigate or, or yeah, have conversations about different aspects of the, the role of the body in uh, in this very sort of uh, suitcasey word artificial intelligence, and then also the ways in which it might be excluded or or ignored. And so today we're kind of we're continuing that the series, the body and AI, as we welcome the media and performance artist director composer and scholar, scholar Marco Donnarumma. Uh, in fact, I'm going to do just put his website in the chat now as well. Marco's uh, performance practice lies directly at the human machine interface. And, and this afternoon, he's going to present some of his work before being in conversation with choreographer and CEDA's postdoctoral fellow, Tiamo Nakarato, who's in the room right there. Uh, and then we'll go after after that conversation between the two of them. We'll we'll then go into an open conversation with with you all. So, Mark, if you're ready to go, I'm going to spotlight you, and then uh, we'll get started. All right. Thanks, Simon. Thanks, Teoma. Um, it's great to be here. Um, I've been following the sea there for a while now. And uh, it's a great pleasure. And thanks also everyone being there in the room. Sorry, I'm not there. Hope I can make it up someday. And thanks everyone online. I see some faces that I know, at least the names. So hi. <laughs> and um, okay, so um, basically, yeah, Simon already mentioned, uh, I'm gonna make a give you a bit more information about this talk and i'm not a big fan of artist talk that goes slide by slide and saying i'm i done that and i done this um so i'm gonna try a different approach uh which may be a little bit overwhelming maybe but i like to work with associations so yes i will talk about my work um i will get into some details of some of, of my works um but I will rather give you an overview of, of what I've been up to in the past 10 years. And uh, I will try to highlight some concepts uh, that we will then discuss with, with Teoma, maybe, if, if they're interesting. And um, at least some of them. And something also that I find interesting, I will try to contextualize the works within the historical context uh, when they were created in relation to the development of artificial intelligence. Um, this I find useful um, for me first, also to, to understand, okay, like artists work with AI and the body, okay, but when they do so, what kind of cultural context is around them when they do so? And, and when they take some specific decision about a certain approach or, or another. Um, I should not be talking for more than 45 minutes. If I go longer, please somebody stop me. And uh, cool. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, there will be also some videos at some point. If the volume is too loud or whatever, please let us know. All right. Okay. So um, this is me with one of the prostheses that I will talk about later. This is a photo by Manuel Bazon, and it pretty much encapsulates what I do. I I work with the body in ways that are unconventional because they do not rely on technologies as they are. 
but I try to abuse technology, turn it upside down, inside out, and do things that are not supposed to do. So for instance, here I have a prosthesis on my face, which is obviously completely useless from a technical point of view, uh, but it does, uh, thinking about somatics and movement and, and phenomenology of experience, it does provide a lot of material to, to work with and perform with live. I will get more to that in a bit. And uh, so here's, this is to explain a little bit my position within the arts. Um, my profile is, is quite strange and um, find it's useful to point out a few things. So where I'm coming from, I basically grew up in media art and um, doing installation, yes, but mostly performances with technology. And I do this since the early 2000s. And back in the days, it, it was quite weird to do performances in media art using emerging technologies, whatever that terms mean. For me, it means technology that are coming out at a certain point of time. And um, why I was doing it, basically because um, I was at the time, early 2000, I was a sound designer um, with a big passion for performance art. So I knew how could use how, how to use sound for for live purposes, and um, I had, I had studied like crazy, passionate uh, performance art, feminist uh, movements connected to it in in the early days, and um, and these slowly, thanks also to some technological instruments that I developed, uh, brought me to develop the practice that I pursue now, which is body-centered and uh, from the body tries to look at other themes and larger aspects such as technology as in robotics, artificial intelligence, but also the language of theater and the language of dance. And uh, all these aspects then today come back in, in my recent work altogether, hopefully in a, in a way that makes sense. But yeah, it was uh, 14 years now of, of really developing a certain practice. And um, at the core of what I do now, uh, coming from, from this kind of path, there is transdisciplinarity, which is not only working across different disciplines, but also asking questions using methods from different disciplines, uh, which I find really refreshing. And then working somehow, uh, pulling stuff from art, science, and technology, see how, how the three can influence one another. And then sound, which is always at the core of, of my work and also of my choreographic work. And uh, then a theory in, in at the theoretical level, um, some, some of the tenets of my work are based on, on feminist studies, um, or more specifically body theory and, and critical disability studies. I'm also disabled, I'm deaf, uh, not completely, but almost, and I wear hearing aids since 10 years. And if I have time towards the end of the talk, I will mention also something about my very latest project, which is ongoing, which is about deafness as well. Let's see. So I want to start with this uh, timeline, um, not because it's really informative of how artificial intelligence developed, but because there are some really cool quotes inside uh, that are kind of demystifying themselves the moment you read them. <laughs> so I find this quite interesting and also to set the, the tone of, of my approach to artificial intelligence. So I use artificial intelligence since 10 years in all kinds of different performances from theater, dance, experimental live art and whatnot. So 
I, I do appreciate the technology and the development of it, but I'm extremely critical about it at the same time for a whole lot of reasons that hopefully I will manage to unfold during this talk. And um, the, the first thing, in fact, for me is important to demystify artificial intelligence. So AI is not a thing that exists in the world. When we mention these two letters, we are talking about a discipline of studies that investigate ways in which machine can learn patterns from data. Uh, learn also is a bit of a sad choice of word because no machine can learn as, as is, is intended in the common sense of the word. What do they do? They find patterns in data. Then if what they find is useful or not, this depends on the people who is using the data. And um, so AI, when it's mentioned these days, is more like a cultural concept and very often a sort of myth about this incredible powerful technology that may achieve singularity at some point and either save us all or kill us all and whatever. Uh, but in reality, it's a, more, it, it's a lot more nuanced as a cultural concept and it's tied profoundly with capital and all the power that comes with it. And of course, it's also tied to normative powers. Uh, so this is a brief introduction. Now, why there is a point of demystifying the technology? Because as you can see from this timeline, um, the so-called fathers of AI, because obviously there are only fathers and no mothers, no? that's also quite telling. Of course, there are, I'm, 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 cold, I'm joking, but that's what you see here, these people, they are conventionally called the father of the discipline. And so in 68, uh, Arthur Clarke and Steve Kubrick said, by the year 2001, we will have machine with intelligence that matched or exceeded humans. That was 25, 20 years ago. Didn't really go that way. Not, not even now. Or Marvin Minsky, another very influential researcher in the field from three to eight years, so around 1980, we will have a machine with the general intelligence of a human being. Of course we don't. And you can go on and on and on. And if you are following minimally the news these days, now we are in the middle of this new race uh, in the AI market, the narrative is pretty much the same. Oh my God, we have a chatbot that developed its own language. Uh, oh my God, the AI is taking over. Oh my God, this and that. Really what comes down to is political choices, capital accumulation and technological development. But the two are entangled in very complex way. And So I said I started about 10 years ago. So what did I do? Well, um, in 2012, I created this piece, Ominous. At the time I was working with um, uh, so-called gestural music. So music that is produced um, with sensors that are placed on the body and uh, can be used to tra transform movement into sound. Um, now with this piece, Ominous, um, this was my second piece for uh, a biophysical musical instrument that I created, which is really uh, roughly saying a sort of stethoscope that amplifies sounds from the body and make it available for real-time manipulation to the performer. So you, you wear this sensor on your body, the sensor amplifies sounds from your muscles, from your heartbeat, wherever you put it. And, uh, and then you can make music with these sounds from your body in real time, manipulating them with digital effects and whatnot. Now, what's interesting about it is that um, there, is, there is very little mediation between movement and sound because movement is sound. 
you don't need to connect the movement to an artificial um, sound engine or something like that. Now, I'm not going to linger too much about it, but all the stuff that I'm talking about are on my website if you're interested, and we have a Q&A afterwards as well. But what did I do with AI here? Well, at the time, people would not call it AI even. <laughs> so back in the days, it was machine learning. And um, that's, that's what the technical term for it is. So machine learning, um, in this case, I trained uh, um, a software that I wrote in collaboration with, with some other people um, at the time at the Edinburgh University. And I wrote this software that could listen in to the sound of my muscles. So it could understand very basic uh, and rough features of my movement. And the only thing that it would do, it would just um, understand when I was about to stop a movement and how long for I was stopping in order to um, drive through the timeline of the piece. So rather than having a timeline that is fixed in time, so you, you are playing some, some musical forms and then the computer jumps onto this other scene. And so you have to adapt yourself to whatever you're doing. Um, in this way, I could have the computer wait for me that I was finished with whatever I was doing and then pass on to the next scene. So this for improvisation was really great. Um, and that's why I was using it in the first place. It was really not rocket science, just something fairly easy. And uh, this was my, my first approach to the technology. Well, what is the point here? Well, um, it was back in the days, it was really just a tool. There was, there was no, like the whole hype that we have now and that there was in the past uh, was not there 10 years ago. Uh, the situation was a lot different. There was not so much investment in machine learning. And it was pretty much a very small niche research in computer science, which then would interface with human computer interaction. And from there in music technology and, and music performance with technology. So a very small thing, very cool, small labs doing it. Uh, quite interesting, actually. Now, my problem with all this stuff was that I was using my body, but without knowing why I was using it. So it was just like, I don't know, eating with a fork. But like, there are a thousand other ways of eating with a fork. And then why exactly a fork? Well, that's, that's because I'm a white guy. That's why I eat with a fork. And that's obviously a very um, rough metaphor to say at the time in that field, uh, the use of the body was taken as just a given. And there was no reflection on what kind of body would be performing in front of an audience. And what could you do with that body beyond manipulating the technology? So that was something that was bothering me a bit. And uh, I started thinking, okay, like I have this body, and with technology, I can, I can have this body do something else or become something else, at least ephemerally for some time. And, um, and then I started developing this idea of, okay, I want to work with, with different forms of embodiment, starting from my body, uh, but I want to inhabit them. I don't want just to make them up and speculate it. I just want my body to be experimented upon as a site for investigating different ways of being with technology. And um, so the first output of this, this kind of process was Corpus Nil um, from 2016. And uh, this was actually the, the first time where I, I started thinking in this way about performance with body and technology and sound. So briefly what happens here is uh, I have the same sensor instrument as before. So the computer captures um, sounds from my muscles 
and also micro voltages from the muscles, which are two complementary signals. And um, in this way, it listens in to the muscular activity of my body. And you can see the two armband here on the upper arms. And what the computer does is there is a machine learning system there that listens to what's happening in my muscular activity. So roughly saying how sudden certain movements are, how much strength there is in a particular movement, how complex is from a, a muscular point of view, a particular movement. And then with these features, it tries to, um, it tries to understand the overall behavior of my body. And then it imitates what's happening inside my body. Um, taking the sound and transforming them into a digital uh, digital landscape, soundscape, if you want. I'm going to show you a little bit of it. So yeah, if, if you can hear any low frequency with whatever system you're using now, you're you're listening to the sound of the muscle, which is not manipulated, but uh, just uh, pitch shifted. So just the pitch is increased a little bit, otherwise it will be infrasound. And yeah, so I, I remember making this piece at the time was, was really challenging for me, like extremely challenging. Um, as I told you, I, I was coming from um, from gestural music uh, context uh, where you basically use only your hands. <laughs> so th there's a funny story behind this piece as well, because you can see, basically, you only see my back. That's what you're seeing there with, with a bit of upper arms. And uh, the reason is because I started hiding the hands because those were the things that I would use most. And um, I find this also very Western. So I can see my ingenuity uh, in, in thinking to play just like everyone else with my hands because I can control stuff. You know, the white man that control things with his hands. Uh, that, that's, that's a very strong trope in technology and in human computer interaction. Um, now I, I say this, it's not, it's not written in much places, but so it is from my point of view. But uh, that said, this very trivial motivation, if you want, of, of wanting to change this kind of embodiment that I, that I had in performances, then led me to, the more I toured this piece and the more I entered into this, this mindset where, okay, there is something more that can happen between the body 
and this software that it's running on a machine. And uh, that has to do with forms of attunement, uh, which then eventually lead to forms of automaticity. So attunement, uh, you know, when you are attuned to something or someone is a certain kind of, of empathy and, and some sort of same resonance. Um, how that can happen with a machine? Well, you listen to the machine uh, because you don't know what really can do in, in, in a, at a specific moment in time. And uh, that's what the improvisation is about in, in this piece in Corpus Neil. And the machine listens to me. So there are, there are moments where I, I must attune myself with the machine because it can go mute from one moment to another without me knowing. So I need to know not much everything that the machine can do, but I need to know at least how to influence it in order to make it realize certain behaviors. So that's a form of attunement that I talk about, which then leads to automaticity. Automaticity is a, a super interesting concept. And um, again, also this is from feminist studies, um, studies of affect and materiality. Lisa Blackman has wrote a lot about this. And so automaticity are these this body movement or bodily behaviors that happen without one rationally thinking about it. And this happens in everyday life, really, but in particular when, when, when there is a performance of sort, a bodily performance, especially a performance that one is very attuned to, and especially when there is a tool or a technology that one is very attuned to. So you kind of respond to, to, to those attunement states in, in an automatic way, without, without or bypassing almost the rational thinking behind it which in the performance then translates to being in a state of, of flow and concentration that does not depend only on your body but also on the inputs that you receive from from your partner in this case these computer running machine learning algorithms uh, the computer creates the sound the computer creates the light um, and especially because I'm deaf, uh, for me, it's very important to listen in quotes to the vibration on the floor stage. Vibration which are produced by the sound created by the computer. So all of these then eventually led me also to discover this other concept from, uh, from feminist studies, especially from feminist feminology, phenomenology, which is the idea of incorporation. Uh, this this very interesting point of view on on technologies that are attached to the body somehow, uh, which normally, especially in conventional phenomenology, would be seen as extensions of the body. But an extension means it's going ex, it's going out. Ex is from Latin, so it's something going from your body outside which yes of course a prosthesis for example it's it's doing that yeah but incorporation means something very different incorporation means that the technology or the prosthesis is embodied becomes part of the embodiment of, of someone or a person so there is in again from the latin coming in so there is something from the outside coming in and this is this is very interesting uh, a very interesting tool to talk about prosthesis and, and body technologies because it 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 doesn't it doesn't undermine the importance and the influence of the technology, but it actually emphasizes it by saying this technology, whatever it is, it will become incorporated in a body. It will change that body, and it's not just an attachment that you can remove and then it's not there anymore. There is something left. And um, yeah, I'm at the time I was I was studying this stuff, and um, there were the first uh, the first signs of the AI hype coming. It's 
it's about 2016, 2017. And Google was making these this huge data sets experiments and somehow they managed an algorithm of theirs to recognize cats uh, among, uh, I don't know how many million images on the internet. And then of course the internet crashed because of this thing. Oh my God, there is a cat in a data set. That's incredible. Uh, but what was really happening there which we know now, but we didn't know back then, was that Google started investing lots of money in neural networks, which uh, is a technology for machine learning that was dead for decades. Uh, it was invented around the 50s, actually it was one of the first applications for machine learning, but then it was quickly uh, left out of the investment cycles because Neural networks require a lot of data, a monumental amount of data, a monumental amount of power. And back in the 50s, nobody had that. But now in 2017, 2018, of course, somebody does, and those are the big corporations, Google, Facebook, Amazon, blah, blah, blah. So, um, I started thinking, okay, like, now we are we are living now that there is this hype coming okay but it's all connected to some some form of capitalism and then how how do you get back that into the body that that you know i was thinking about incorporation i was thinking about this this very how to say hmm. yeah somehow immaterial aspects of embodiment in relation to technology and uh, i was i was a bit put uh, put uh, pushed back by this development in the industry that because also obviously it reflected in the culture and uh, in the public opinion and um, so inspired by this quote by mark fisher which is one of my best ever says, yes, capitalism is what is left when beliefs have collapsed at the level of ritual or symbolic elaboration. And all that is left is the consumer spectator trudging through the ruins and the relics. I find this so, so brilliant. This is really the society we are living in. Uh, but apart from that, there is some interesting reflection here about rituals. So it's not that we are not, we are without rituals, it's that the rituals that we have are vessels of what they used to be. And they are vessels at the same time, vehicles for capitalists to increase its funding, its power, and so on. All social networks are a ritualized action that we do every day. But who goes to the carnival anymore? No, especially in Europe. It's very rare. No, so just to make an example. But anyway, um, so I came up with this idea of making an AI prosthesis that would learn a ritual of skin cutting. Again, learning, I already mentioned, that's not a word to be used. And here I'm using it exactly to make a provocation. Um, so yeah, now the story of the work, this work is quite long, but I'm, I'm already not, not to find with the time. So I'm gonna skim a bit through it. But yeah, basically this is a robotic prosthesis um, with a knife that learns to cut its own skin throughout three or four months of an exhibition and so forth. But then there is a trick and also the, the skin, which I prepare, it's very soft in the beginning, but then it becomes increasingly harder until the robot cannot cut it anymore. So this implies two things. First, that the robot never finishes learning, which is really an awkward way of using AI and machine learning. And the second is that towards the end of the exhibition, the robot will be breaking itself trying to break the skin. So th there are many questions I try to raise with this, with this work. Um, there are some questions regarding a ritual that I, that I mentioned now. And there are also some questions about embodiment. The machine uh, is not um, is not pre programmed 
to execute particular movements like most robots, but it actually generates movements by itself with using some neural networks. And uh, the movements it generates, then it's uh, recalibrated, readjusted through sensory input that it is uh, coming from the motors. So every time a motor touches something, it, it sends it, this information back to the computer and the computer understands, okay, I'm touching something. And then it kind of investigates this, trying to see um, what kind of consistency the material is, how much can it push. And, and, and in this way, then it uh, keeps learning. You can see a bit in action here. So this was fascinating because it allowed me to think about also these, these um, ideas of attunement and automaticity from, from the other point of the body of a machine. That was quite interesting. The machine, of course, is not human. It does not learn anything properly. It does learn in a computational way. That, of course, it does. Uh, but then, for instance, it doesn't feel pain it has a very small memory of its experience. And of course, it's just repeating the same thing over and over. And so I found it interesting to make this provocation and see where, where it would lead. And uh, it actually was quite fruitful for, for, my, for my artistic research. Because then from here, I started working with prosthesis in, um, in performance, in theater and dance. So, um, a key point here for me uh, that came out with and through Amygdala was the idea of objection, uh, which, is, which is a very, uh, it's quite a broad concept and it can be applied to many different topics. But it became quite important for me, especially after reading Kristeva, uh, another wonderful author that I love. And she has this quote in Approaching Objection, which is absolutely fantastic. So it is not an absence of health or cleanliness which makes something object but that which perturbs an identity, a system, an order, that which does not respect limits, places, or rules. Now, this is, this is pure genius as an observation. So what is an objection is that feeling of repulsion and fascination at the same time that you may have some time for something. Normally, this image creates a bit of objection in people. This is the skin from the robot, and there are hairs from my body onto it. Uh, so if you're feeling something, it's probably likely objection now. And But what's interesting in, in Kristeva's thought here is that normally, uh, objection is, is thought of being something that addresses a, a dirtiness, an impureness or something. But she says it does, it does not really have to do with that. Uh, it is not about being dirty or being sick. It's actually about being like you, but different. So it is something object is something that creates a disruption within a system of knowledge, essentially. And uh, more practically, what creates objections? People with physical disability, because they are like non-disabled people and non-disabled people can see in them what their body could be. And that's why feeling of objection emerges. I mentioned this example as a disabled person myself for those who joined the chat later and i'm i'm deaf so i don't i have the privilege of not having a physical disability but i have other problems on my own and so the the concept of objection became quite important in my work and i i still bring it with me till now and um 
So yeah, now we are in 2018. And I'm trying to work out these, these relations between ritual, incorporations, objections. At the same time, the AI hype is going through the roof, completely through the roof. And um, I decided to try make another prosthesis that actually work with my body. And uh, in partnership also with another performer, Margherita Pevere, a long time collaborator of mine, who is also a bio artist and a performer. And so we make this piece together that's called Dying Evide. And I'm wearing the prosthesis that, that you see in the initial, that you saw in the initial pictures. And um, now what happens here is a sort of ritual of coalescence. These, these two bodies start being together as one, but then they get separated and each of them finds something. So my body finds this piece of technology that I bring on my face and the body of Margherita finds a bacterial film, uh, which is cellulose created by bacteria that she uh, nurture. And then together with these other components, non-human components, then we become another body together. But there is no resolution, there is no happy ending. This picture is from the end of the piece. So it, it, it just remains there suspended. And, and it's really about the fluidity of, of embodiment and the fact that there are really no standards for the type of embodiment and there are no standards for beauty and there are no standards for what we think technology can do with the body. Show you a couple of images from here. So this was another, another milestone for me. Um, it, well, it was the first time I worked with another performer first, uh, because for until now I had worked uh, solo always. Uh, that a big change. But also using technology and other materials like this bacterial cellulose by Margarita together on stage that ob obviously represents quite, quite some challenge. 
and um, and also from an engineering point of view, how to create a prosthesis, which you can see better in this image, um, that is suitable for performance. Uh, so contrary to amygdala the, the, that I showed earlier, this one is a lot lighter. Uh, it can break more easily, but that means also it can be repaired more easily. And um, it has this very long cable, so it's still wired, but it allows movement. And, uh, and obviously it covers my gaze. And that again comes back to this, this idea of attunement and automaticity, but tries to investigate this relation further. So this prosthesis is pretty much from a programming point of view, like amygdala. Uh, obviously it doesn't have a knife, but it does use this tip to explore uh, my body and whatever is in the surrounding environment. So it can also find the body of the other performers, Margarita, for example. And then it has a, a, a range of uh, physical reaction that it can produce to different uh, degrees of interaction with the outside world. Now, what's interesting is that because I cannot see, I don't even know where I'm going on stage. And that's on purpose because the way I wanted to work with this was to let me be driven by the prosthesis. So obviously I know where I have to go. There is a choreography but I cannot see where that is. And so I use the, the vibration of the motor of the prosthesis to uh, understand whether the prosthesis has found an obstacle or whether it's moving freely, uh, because all of these different behaviors have different kinds of vibration. So here we come back again to the way the technology is incorporated in the body. And I'm talking only about the, my experience as performer so far, uh, but all of these experiments that I do with the body, I do them also because I think they transmit something different to the audience. Um, I think, and I hope, uh, maybe that's not the case, I don't know. Um, for the feedback that I have, normally something happened. And again, it's it's about it's related to it's related to this idea of perturbing a system. So I'm I'm disturbing my body as a system, but I'm also disturbing at the same time, or at least I try to disturb the idea of artificial intelligence and show in different ways how it can affect human embodiment. In this particular case, my own embodiment of a white person from Europe. And um, I think that's important because first it shows how bodies can learn at edges of experience. So not only in your comfort zone of experience, but also you put your body at the edge of, a, of something, of a physical experience, of a psychosomatic experience. Because there you can learn a lot. Uh, you can learn a lot about yourself, about your body and others, about others and your body. Things that you can not learn in your comfort zone of experience. And obviously there is a whole topic that I will not get into now, but that has to do with medicalization and the medicalization of disability. That's also very important in the reason why I work with prosthesis so much. And so we jump a few years forward and uh, we are now a couple of years ago and I'm about to finish as well. So I have this wonderful quote from David Olds. Now, David Olds is the founder of Mid Journey, which if you don't know, you can Google now and you will see what it is. It is basically, a so-called AI image generator. Um, by the way, for those who know, David Olds was also the founder of Leap Motion, used quite a lot in dance technology. And um, so what's the point of this? Well, 
you remember at the time of Ayn Gavai, the, the hype of AI was coming. Google was using huge data sets with, with new investment in neural, in neural networks and so on. So what happens in those four or five years? Well, they put more money into the neural networks. Uh, they started developing deep learning, uh, which is nothing but neural networks like if in the 50s, but with a lot more net neural net neuron. So a lot larger models. But then what happened, they started also to make some sort of Frankenstein uh, algorithmic systems that started borrowing techniques from thermodynamics, uh, from statistic, from prob probability studies. And uh, we end up with uh, ChatGPT today, Bard from Google, uh, Bing, which is always the same system. And uh, a little uh, on the side, we also have these image generators, Mid Journey, Dali, Stable Diffusion, and they are all based on the same thing, which is this Frankenstein algorithmic systems that use probability and deep learning um, on data that is taken from the web. So a huge data sets with billions images and billion text that is taken from the web without consent of anyone and without any sort of, of um, discerning be between the components. Why they do this? Well, uh, Mr. Olds here says why. I do think the world needs more beauty. Basically, if I create something that allows people to make beautiful things, and there are more beautiful things in the world, that's what I want by default. The emphasis is mine. I, I don't think I need to say anything about this quote, but okay, like, of course, beauty is not universal. What Holtz is talking about is probably his own view of, of beauty. And he's also not taking into consideration the world may be already full of beauty and some part of the human system, especially the capitalistic one, are destroying that beauty already. And Mr. Holtz is a bit part of that too. But um, so to dramatize a bit, I will show you this nice artwork that I made with stable diffusion. <laughs> For those who don't know, as, as I said, basically this system work with huge data sets and then they they grasp feature of existent artworks or text for chat gpt and they smash things together they created this pastiche so this is an image that i made for an article i wrote for hyperallergic which is online for everyone to read and there is actually a follow-up uh, journal article coming and here um, i asked the uh, stable diffusion to create an image of a dog by francis bacon Inside a flower by Georgia O'Keeffe. And that's the amazing, terrifying result of it. Anyway, I will just make a pace, uh, pause. Um, okay, I'm going to try to go through fast these last two things. So, in, in all this journey, we arrived, so we started from, from a time around 10 years ago where machine learning was, was really just a toolkit, very small uh, research laboratories around uh, machine learning has a huge history already now, but investment are not so, not so good. And so it is a small thing done by little people here and there. Then slowly the AI come, who knows whether the investment came first or the hype came first or together, it's hard to know. But then money is poured in and these very large models, that's a technical name for it, um, start emerging. And now, if, if you read any tech news, you will know that uh, ChatGPT and, and its implementation are causing really a lot of troubles because it's not regulated. The Euro, European Commission is starting now to try and regulate it, but it's really apt for creation of misinformation, abuse of, of, of power, abuse of data, and plenty of other things. So if you don't know about it, you can Google and you will find again, 
despite being Google, it will tell you anyway what's, what's the problem with it. So what happened basically? Well, we, we passed from machine learning being a toolkit to AI being a cultural concept stamped on our face every day and in, in about 10 years, not more. So um, this required, at least for me, also a different way of, of working with it because, because yes, now artificial intelligence is really a strong cultural component uh, of everyday life in, in all kinds of fields. And even if you don't know anything about artificial intelligence, you know that this is the time of AI. So um, I, had, I had the fortune to uh, found an artist group uh, called Fronte Vacuo with Margherita Peveri, which you saw in my performance before, and Andrea Familari, uh, another media artist. And together we started putting together our expertise, so body and technology for me, bio art and performance from Margherita and video and light design from Andrea to make sort of alternative forms of live art. So we, we have components of dance, we have components of theater, we have components of body art and technology and organism on, on our, in our pieces and so forth. Now trying to make this a bit uh, shorter, uh, I'm going to show you this piece, or this is a piece that was made uh, during the pandemic, and um, it is a reflection on AI as a cultural concept and the components that make it up, which are many. Uh, but here we wanted to emphasize the role of loops, the role of instructions in the formation of algorithmic violence, uh, which is a term that I like to use to indicate that new forms of violence that, that are out there. There are new forms of violence. It doesn't mean that the victims of this violence are new. Unfortunately, they are not. It's always the marginalized, uh, uh, BIPOC, disabled, and so forth, poor working class. Uh, but the forms of through which this violence is applied is different because this AI is a concept. It's not only something that we can laugh about with ChatGPT and mid journey, but it's also used in a very serious context. Wars for autonomous weapons. It's used for uh, welfare, decides who gets an insurance, who gets a house and who don't. It's used in the prison system. Uh, so today this concept of AI, which again, it's probabilistic, a probabilistic form of pattern matching is really driving uh, pretty much large parts of societies in the West and in the East, mostly advanced capitalistic societies. And um, so we made this piece, let me show you a bit. Um,
happens here, the, the principle is actually um, quite simple. Uh, so th this is a character that returns quite often in, in our fictional world. Um, and it's a sort of master of ceremony. And uh, what, what the character is doing is just praying to the machine. Um, and the machine, which is a computer running um, a computer vision AI system, is trying to recognize the figure that is praying in the darkness. So the way it does it is it, it uses the lights to light up the figure, which otherwise cannot see, and, um, and slowly recognize the shape of the body um, of the body praying. In fact, here, this white and gray stuff that you see, it's the AI system reconstructing the image of the body in real time during the performance. But what happened is that the more uh, the machine recognizes the body, so it can reconstruct the figure, the more it illuminates the stage. That's a hard-coded link that we made. And so this provokes the system to go into a feedback with itself. The more it learns, the more it cannot see eventually. And, and this creates this very interesting tension between within the body and the tower of light, which is this, this machine there. Um, This is a reflection of, on, on these ideas of loop and instruction that are a bit um, end in themselves eventually. So all the instruction, which are programmed instruction or low instruction or untold instructions, um, when they are driven by machines, there are they involve so many agencies at play. So there is the agency of of the the programmers of the machine, of the owners of it, of the people who fund it, but there is also the agency of the machine itself, which is not a human agency. It's not uh, uh, any other living being agency. It's it's a very different sort of computational agency, which nevertheless can be effective and disruptive, and it is indeed, as we can see also in the terrible shape uh, our societies are. Um, yeah, I think I should stop now. So I'm gonna leave you with this quote, which is another one of my favorites. Uh, this is by Yamiri Baraka, um, American writer and poet, poet, poet and um, teacher and writer, very incredible, talented person. And um, he wrote machines, the entire technology of the West is just that, the technology of the West. Nothing has to look or function the way it does. The West man's freedom unscientifically got at the expense of the rest of the world's people has allowed him to expand his mind spread this sensibility wherever it go, and so shape the world and its powerful artifacts and genes. It just says everything. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a very good reality check, especially for us white people, at least I speak for myself. And technology doesn't have to be that way. And in, in my in my little of my in my little world of my artistic practice, that's also what, what I try to do. That's why I find so inspiring. This really gave me uh, food for thought. So technology is there, but it doesn't need to be developed, implemented, or designed in that way. And especially as artists, I find the responsibility to find different alternative ways of using this technology and showing what they can do in, in the good, in the bad, and everything that is in between because what what i think it's important to have these days and to emphasize is imagination i think i think we as as a society especially in europe we are losing our imagination and this has very dramatic effects in my opinion so all of this to say let's get back on our imaginative exercises and trying to learn something new from what doesn't exist.
Thank you. Thank you so much, Marco. Yeah, we're in a room, so people wanted to clap. <laughs> <laughs> that was a, a really rich sharing uh, and such a, a rich body of work. I really appreciated seeing the uh, development of the two lines that, that you both in the narrative of your work from the early miles of the music through to the work now. I have many questions, I'm sure others will as well, but um, to get us started, uh, I, I just want to zoom in on something from earlier in the presentation, something quite simple from, I think it was when you were discussing Ominous, you described the uh, relationship between well, you, your movement, and the sound that was created as uh, not having much uh, mediation, as the movement really being the sound. And I was wondering, in light of then all of the other work that you shared and all of the context you drew for us around the sort of complex systems involved in mating, what might seem like it's unmediated. I wonder if you could sort of expand on this notion of mediation, not in, a, in terms of defining it, but in terms of your work and how you see that role inside of all of these different pieces and uh, processes and ecosystems you've developed. Hmm. Yeah, that of mediation is, is always a complex question. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's not something that I try to avoid, for sure. And actually, I think it becomes a, uh, another artistic tool, if you want to. And normally, if you think about interactive technology and performance and dance, uh, um, one can negotiate and design the level of mediation that is ongoing. And um, it's interesting because there are many different school of thought. So in, in that field of gestural music, uh, mediation really comes down to mapping. So how do you connect a certain movement or aspect of movement to um, a certain sound or parameter of sound? And, but again, it doesn't take into consideration any other mediation that is ongoing, which is, it can be also the mediation of your computer CPU. It can be the mediation of what kind of audience is in front of you. It can be the mediation of your body, especially if you, if you work with body sensors, uh, your body is never the same. And you always have to readjust or play with, with those differences. So I yeah, I, I think I think it's it's interesting to take the concept of mediation as as a thing to play with. Yeah, it is uh, an interesting question in here about where uh, something you might call mediation is visible and where it's not visible because it's sometimes easier to poke inside of AI or in large systems, but there's also a lot going on inside of something that is, you know, John, you, I think you built the sensor that you had on your arms, right? It was the X-Sense in, in Ominous, but there's mm. a lot going on inside of the design of that media. And also when you have it on your arms, I was really interested to hear that part of your, the influence for you was taking away the hands, which working in a mm. music gesture context, you know, that makes a big difference, but still then having these uh, sensors on your arm is it this, perhaps inspired particular choreography or particular type of movement inside of that is for you. Yeah, yeah, totally. Uh, absolutely. In fact, um, in Corpus Nil, that was the first time that I moved the sensors on my body, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and, and, and there you go, revelation. Oh my God, now everything is different. I have to move differently. Because I don't have any any dance training, so I, I am where I am now because I worked with my body on my own. Um, and so, yeah, moving, changing the position of the body, of the sensors on the body, then was illuminating for me because I started realizing, okay, not only I can move other parts of the body <laughs> to make a performance, uh, but it changes the kind of interaction it changes drastically the kind of interaction that you can have with a machine. 
And that was also an interesting point for me because that very small observation and naive observation, if you want, at the time was my first access point into um, resisting the idea of control in technological immediate performance. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, the idea of control in technology is obviously uh, a huge territory to explore. Um, but that's what I found interesting because it, 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 it is something that is still with me always, like to make technologies that, that are not made to be controlled. Mm -hmm. I find that also quite inspiring as a performer then it's connected to improvisation, of course, uh, but also how the audience perceive the kind of relations with technology that you want to communicate. Right. Yeah, I mean, this already broadens it a little bit because although we might see that you move your arm and it makes a sound, we already know, okay, there was this background in music that had to do with the movement of the hands and now it's moving to the arm. There's a particular sort of framing within which, you know, that was developed. Uh, I, I also find it really striking that, so first you remove the hands and the sensors came to your arms. And then thinking about the prosthesis that you developed, the long uh, amygdala, it to me it really resembles a, an arm, but without the rest of the body there, which is much longer and which is almost an exaggeration of this use of the hands to manipulate uh, mm -hmm. space. I never thought about that, but yes, <laughs> you could see it that way too. Yeah, no, it's interesting. I work with the prosthesis um, with um, a designer and artist called Anna Rajcevic. Very, very great artist. Everybody should know her work, Anna Rajcevic. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and it was nice because actually the design of the prosthesis is made on, on, on my arms actually <laughs> on, because I have this very thin body and from there we started thinking about bones and then so forth so from there this thing came out and um but I never thought about about that like for me is it's yeah I don't know for me it's more like a tentacle like mm -hmm. like the, the the sense the bodily sensation that I have when I perform with it it's more yeah more like a tentacle something it's like that and um it's also curious how, how you know, I, I always think that anthropomorphizing machines is really something to avoid, but then having worked with these machines, having made them from scratch mm -hmm. and being involved in, in touring with them for years, then you do anthropomorphize them anyway. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's crazy how, how, how at least my brain works. Uh, that's also another aspect of it because then it's it's a tentacle that has some sort of life on its own. But it's also very, I mean, it's it's very stupid what it does. It just moves on 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 two axes, you know. Then yeah, it's fascinating that to me that it can generate movement by itself, but we made it on purpose almost stupid. So it, it just has two axes and, and we wanted to. Explore how much can you make a machine move expressively only with the minimum axis of movement, and it, and it's quite telling because because people is really amazed and they and they can perceive nuances which I think you wouldn't perceive if the prosthesis was more complex. Mm -hmm. I don't know how, but I mean, of course, there is also the programming. The neural network that they use are um, are are a design borrowed by. Uh, a lab core called Neuro Robotics uh, Research Laboratory here in Berlin. And they are a sort of neural network they're called biomimetic because they, they imitate uh, the sensory motor system of animals. So that's why there is this generation of movement, which is basically an oscillation that then is affected by sensory input. And so this causes the prosthesis to move quite as, as a living thing. And I think the fact that it has only two axes of movement emphasizes this aspect. And, and so it becomes also more interesting to see. But at the end of the day, it's a very a relatively simple machine. Hmm. It's interesting to hear it's modeled after animals. Is that, uh, the, um, the first prosthesis, the one that had the knife that was cutting through the prosthetic skin, this I found to be quite a violent image. 
And when you then uh, showed us the next video with the one that was affixed from your head, uh, at first I was I thought it still had a knife. <laughs> the, the the notion that you were using vibration rather than vision to sense in the space was a, an interesting adaptation. Mm. So sorry, I had to change my batteries. No worries. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah that, that's something that i discovered after two or three performances um because yeah i don't know i i work in this way i really like to try out things because i like the process of experimenting and and i also like the fact that by focusing on the process um it's very easy for unexpected things to come out. And normally the unexpected things are more exciting than the thing that you thought beforehand, um, at least for me. And so, yeah, we had this idea of covering the face, but then we didn't really reason out, okay, how are you going to do this actually? <laughs> um, so I do have a bit of periphery, peripheral view and that helped me not hurting myself in the first performances. Um, but then, yeah, it became quite normal to me. Again, being being deaf person, you you are quite attuned to vibration and low frequencies. Um, for me, at least, it's it's psychophysiological, I think. And uh, so, the vibration is quite strong on your face. So once you stop thinking, oh, I cannot see, and you start thinking about your other senses. Then you realize, oh, but there is a very strong vibration here. Mm -hmm. And then because I made the machine and I program it, then of course it's easier for me because I know what certain pattern of vibration can indicate. And so I trained myself wearing the prosthesis for hours and yeah, getting attuned to its own movement and reactions. It is, it mm -hmm. is fascinating when it touches Margarita on stage. Um, because she cannot react because she also doesn't see. Um, and so the machine like keeps poking on her head. <laughs> so I actually, that's how I know that I'm touching her. <laughs> okay. Uh, she also can't see what she, is it from the costuming? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because she has this mask of cellulose. And um, so basically she can see light going through the cellulose. Um, but she cannot distinguish shapes or forms or stuff like that. And she actually wear the, the mask since the beginning. I, I wear the prosthesis after a while in the performance. Um, but that's also interesting because the um, Margarita makes her performance onto uh, coarse salt, um, which, which is made for a lot of other artistic reasons, which I will spare you now. Uh, but the mask then um, actually protect her face from scratches and, and other things from the salt. And that's also something that we just realized afterwards. So it's conceptually is interesting because on one hand, it blocks her gaze. So it impedes her embodiment to some extent. And then on the other hand, it protects her body. So this mm -hmm. is also quite fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, just to broaden the, the scope a little, you uh, said something that very early in your presentation, maybe the first sentence about how you like to abuse technologies mm -hmm. and use them in sort of unexpected or unusual ways. Uh, and that is you know, evident throughout your body of work that you shared today. Um, I'm curious then how you sort of reconcile that with what you were sharing in terms of your framing of AI in the context of capitalism and patriarchy, et cetera. There were a lot of very strong quotes and in you know in what way are you able to sort of appropriate or, or use these technologies in critical ways how do you see that inside of your practice but also as perhaps a, a necessity or something that's important in the context of art making mm. it's complicated it's, it's a complicated <laughs> relation sorry <laughs> sorry I'm, say I'm also drawing on your paper that i just read <laughs> that you shared ah uh, yeah yeah, no worries, you're welcome. Um, it's a complicated relation. Um, you know, on, on one hand, I'm I'm very much a nerd. 
and I like technology. I grew up with technology and I like to use them to, to do things with them. Um, on the other side, I, I'm pretty much invested in politics, but not the politics of the politicians, more the politics of relations, the politics of power. And um, as, a, as a writer and as a researcher, like I cannot be blind to everything that's happening and, and also where this particular development of artificial intelligence is coming from. Because one of the points I like to make always is uh, deep learning, probabilistic learning, these techniques that are used today for these massive models that are upsetting all, everything right now. This is just one very special way of researching artificial intelligence. There is, there is a history with hundreds, if not thousands of different techniques for uh, making machines learn pattern and find information and whatnot. Uh, but this particular way of working, it's so tightly connected to the capital of data um, and of free labor on which all these corporations made their money and shaped our society, at least in our uh, Western Euro-American um, context. In, in China and neighboring countries, it's pretty much the same. They have a different philosophy, but in, at, at the level of the capitalistic society and industries, the approach is pretty much the same. So they, you know, they not only this this massive corporation shaped uh, very drastically the way we interact with one another, um, but then now they are taking that and using it against what is left of culture, mm -hmm. <laughs> creating these massive databases that exploit the work of artists, uh, exploit the work of real people paid nothing to filter the bad stuff that they fished out of the internet. Um, so they make their own sweats lab. Um, and, and again, then what really bothers me is that they are trying to use a very superficial notion of creativity that they ascribe to their own system with text, with images and everything. They're using that as a Trojan horse to make people use this stuff so that they can sell it and they can do everything they want with it. And the creativity then becomes just a distraction, no? Just, just like, I don't know, specchio per allodole, we call it in Italian, I don't know what the English is. And, and this is also a distraction from what I mentioned earlier, that this system are not only chat GPT and whatnot, but I don't know, for those who know TensorFlow, is a machine learning library of Google, which is one of the most widely used for also in, in culture and arts. So TensorFlow was used uh, until a few years ago, and I think it still is, but I cannot say for sure, in um, attack and recognition drones uh, of the US. Yeah, I, I, know that, uh, I'm sorry. I know that no, just dropped a link to your Medium article on this topic into the chat. So that can mm. be, oh, sorry, it wasn't Medium. It was a I I right? I so I kind of privileged your cat. I know that's in there and I have so much to say in response to that, but I think for the final half hour, it would really be nice to open it up. And I see that we have mm. five questions inside of the Q&A. Um, sure, um, should we unspotlight you so that you're please unspotlight. I, can, uh, <laughs> I mean, no, I don't, I don't want to. Oh, so we can have a conversation <laughs> with everyone, exactly. Yeah, and you yeah. as well, Mark. Uh, oh, yeah, okay. Give me just one second. The other battery is out of charge now, so I need, but uh, if I stop this, I'm not gonna hear anything. So, just one second, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Um, 
Marco, are you back? I'm back. Thank you. Okay. Well, our first question is from Vip, and she's asking, to what extent were you the machine's prosthesis? Does the machine need prosthesis? At which point do we become the AI's prosthesis? Are we already its prosthesis? <laughs> to what extent are we being used by the machine? And there's a follow-up of how was Margarita's experience of perturbing their body different from yours, with yours being a white European male? With a lot of provocation. <laughs> inside. Very good ones. Uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. So, huh. yeah, I mean, I'm happy that you're picking up this point of, of my body as a performer being the machine prosthesis because, yeah, that's, that's really something that I think a lot about. Mm. Of course, I'm a different kind of prosthesis and um, we do interact in, in very intimate ways and uh, our agencies are very different. But somehow they encounters with one another through the body. And um, so yes, to some extent, we are prosthesis of, of prosthesis, <laughs> prosthesis <laughs> of one another. But it, what I like about your question is, is that it brings up to me the idea of, of interdependence. And, and this is something that is really dear to me. Um, this part also, my whole idea of, body and technology rest on, on this concept of what I call configuration. So, you know, you can make a configuration with parts of a body and parts of a machine. Um, you can leave a configuration when it's made. You can also change a configuration and you can also have a process of configuring things. <laughs> but what this means to me is that it's not just pairing things, it's just not, taking two things together and putting them like that it's really more like my hearing aid they are they are designed for my ear and they fit very well my ear and they can also be very annoying on amount of different levels of things uh, but we are configured for one another and i can also configure the machine and the machine configures my hearing and my whole embodiment in a different ways so this brings up this idea of interdependence when, where exactly you could say that the body becomes the prosthesis of, of a machine. And of course, I made only trivial example, but if you think about what happens when this configuration go wrong, when, when there is a different tension between them, when, when there is exploitation, when there is violence of instructions and so forth. And uh, how was Margarita's experience? Um, yeah, she should say this. Um, but yeah, we wrote a, a, an article about it. Um, so uh, maybe I can send you the title somewhere. But so I think for her also was a process of discovery. Uh, because yeah, pretty much like me, okay, we said, oh yeah, okay, let's make this mask, and then we don't see on stage, and okay, and then you are on stage, say, oh shit, I cannot see, <laughs> okay, um, and then you find out ways. Uh, so you train with this mask, and you you get used to it. I have to say that Margarita worked for many years with this material and with these cultures, uh, this culture. So she's also quite familiar with the material and the, the, the affordances of the material. But I think for, for her, uh, if I remember well what she told me is on, on one hand, it's, it's quite a harsh experience also because the, um, the cellulose and the bacteria, they grow in um, vinegar. So they have, the mask has a very vinegar scent, very strong. And uh, that plus not seeing and, and the performance that Margarita does, which is very demanding at the bodily level, makes it quite harsh. But then at the same time, she says often how she feels also nicely embraced by the mask because the mask is wet, uh, it's very smooth. And as we mentioned before, uh, talking with Teoma, it, it does also protect 
her face from from the big salt on the stage and from from my prosthesis as well and so it has i think this this ambiguous and pluripotent uh, relation with with the mask this is very similar to, to the way i have with the with the machine yes. Uh, our next question was from Charlie. Hi, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, sure. So I find it really interesting that um, you gave yourself blindness um, as a result, but also provided yourself an additional sense through the prosthetic uh, arm, essentially, that you gave yourself. Um, but that, that AI-powered arm is also learning in inverted commas, as well as you were learning to try and use it and navigate using it. Um, mm. And I wondered in what sense that is also representative of how we see organisms in, in, in that are non-human that evolve to be blind and also sense. And I'm wondering if there's any sort of, was there anything that came up for you in, in that sense or at all? Hmm. Okay. Yeah, it is fascinating. Um, well, you know, I have to say, okay, two things. Um, the, the, the reason why I started thinking about making myself blind um, is because I'm, I'm living through this process with my deafness. Um, and it was, it, it is an ongoing process. And so I have um degenerative sensory neural impairment. So I'm I'm becoming increasingly deaf. Um, and I was diagnosed 10 years ago, but I think it started earlier. Uh, but I come from the hearing world. I, I grew up as a normal, I prefer to say non-disabled person. And, and then I became disabled. And uh, I think this gives me the privilege of understanding the, the the toughness uh, but also the richness of the process that a person can go through and uh, so from there it, it, it wasn't too difficult to think about okay let's lose some other senses in a very loose way and um, on the other hand I could never pretend to be blind so even when even if, if I mask my face completely, the fact of not seeing does not make a person blind. Um, and that's that's quite important. There the, were like old school uh, disability studies where non-disabled scholar would would, I don't know, like close their ears to study how deafness embodiment work and and like no, like it. It doesn't work that way, be exactly because embodiment is not just one sense. So if you have the embodiment of a deaf person, you are embodied with your whole body, with your own world. You are deaf with your own relations. So now coming back to your question, um, that, that was to say, I yeah, I really don't know how blind organisms live, and I would love to. Uh, they're probably live very differently from uh, deaf human organism, I would say. Um, but yeah, what what you see in in in, in living creatures that are blind is that they 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 are blind because they don't need it. You know, most of the time, as far as I know, or I can think now. So. Yeah, maybe the short answer is I could get a glimpse, a, a, a fictional glimpse by performing this piece, but I will never have the answer really to these questions. And we should ask this cute organism. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, Scott, you ask the next question. <clears throat> oh, okay. Um, what is it? Thank you, Marco, for the um, for showing the work. It's been really, really fascinating. I I, I heard you say. I think I heard you say um, that you see us losing our imagination, and I just wondered if you could say a little more about what you mean by that. Mm, yeah. Thank you, Scott. 
I'm a big fan of your work, by the way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so th thanks for this question. Mm. So this is actually not my thinking, um, but I take this from, from Mark Fisher. And um, I mean, he, he, he said it in a few places, maybe not exactly in this way, but uh, the, the idea, I, I take it from him. And um, it is this, so the, the, the way he said it is that if you think about capitalism, you should consider also that capitalism is not just a financial or political or governmental structure. But imagine that capitalism is like an atmosphere. It's like a fog around you. Um, and what, what, what this fog does is create a curtain over the horizon. That's a beautiful metaphor that, that, that Mark used. And um, I find I find this quite telling of, of, of the world today. So I think with all the choices, in quotes, choices that we are given in our Western society, at least, and uh, all these technologies and all these oh and all this progress, uh, um, it becomes very hard to think of something that doesn't exist. And um, of course, for, for Mark Fisher, this brings up the problem that we are not able to imagine a society that is not a, cap a capitalistic society. And then for me, um, as, as an artist, it also brings up very important question about also what, what I am doing. Am I imagining something that is already out there? I, am I reinforcing paradigms and idioms that I'm fed every day without even knowing, or I'm actually saying something different, and I would really rather the latter. And I think it is important, and I notice these days with technology, because they, they become more accessible, again, at least in the global north, and, um, and the first instinct is always to use it as they are. Um, but in this way, one risks reinforcing all the normative powers that are at play there. Um, yeah. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Mark Fisher, I hadn't, um, that's interesting. I was thinking of, um, we had Lucy Suchman here last week, uh, mm. last night, a couple of, and, and she speaks uh, of these kinds of ideas around the notion of the imaginary and dehumanization. And then there's also Jennifer Rhee who wrote a book, The Robotic Imaginary where she so oh, yeah. really draws attention to this uh, dehumanization element. And I, 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 uh, um, I um, but uh, I hadn't thought about Mark Fisher. That's interesting. Thank you. Mm, you're welcome. Thank you. Uh, our next questions were from Victor online. Do you want to answer questions? Do you want to read about? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm reading. I think, can other people see them? No. No. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. So, so we should. Yeah. yeah. So um, Victor has asked. I or says I got to know you in the first place ten years ago through your electronic music duo Dada. Am I pronouncing that right, Marco? Uh -huh. hmm. um, what is the relation between your work as a performance artist to your work purely as a musician slash sound designer? Do these two practices influence each other or are they separated? And with a follow-up, mm -hmm. you are also part of electronic music duo. Oh, maybe I, this, I think this, this hasn't been asked yet. Yeah. Yeah. It's the same. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Teoma. Thank you, Victor. Uh, I'm glad to be the that up fan here. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have to say, actually, uh, 10 years ago, it was another person, Giovanni Conti. Uh, I joined like five or six years ago, um, but yeah, the dub existed back then and your question is still valid. Um, yeah, so um, I, didn't, I didn't explore that in depth now, but um, when I mentioned the instrument that I created that captures sound from, from the body, um, and then all the works that, that I showed you are, are made using also that instrument. When I made that, I was doing a master by research in sound design. So for me, it was 
an experiment into finding new ways of of using sound and uh, and then that's really by a happy accident brought me to the body and the sound of the body and so from there on um being a musician slash sound designer whatever you call it and a performer really go hand in hand i'm pretty much incapable of making a choreography without sound uh it really just i can't and um and i like I like these days also to to come back to it more deeply now that I have a better awareness of of also of my deafness and of deafness in general after all these years. And I'm rediscovering with it. I'm doing a new project about deafness and sound and AI, and I'm doing research with a, a group of other uh, deaf people. And uh, it's being very cool to have this background as a sound designer. <laughs> And and talk about this topic and explore this topic now into performance through the lens of deafness. It 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 is really something interesting. And in general, I think it's also it's also a privilege that I have in having this background because I feel like music is is often overlooked in in dance and theater and. Um, there are of course great examples but just talking in general that's my view um so i feel the privilege to be able to imagine what kind of sound could reinforce a certain movement or or thinking more in in terms of structures or how you can use sound in a dance theater piece to move people around different location of a space like like we do with, with our artist front evacuo so yeah it, it's something that i really enjoy and i don't think my work would exist otherwise really yeah thanks for the answer sorry for the confusing <laughs> confusing with the other guy uh but do you uh also still do performances like a traditional kind of uh performances with the dot up uh and and i guess it's kind of quite a different approach to be having two guys on the stage uh in contrast to kind of your performance art yeah yeah totally i i, I still perform with the dub and actually we have some tour upcoming um but also you know i also do as Marco Donnarumma, as an artist, I also do sound pieces. So uh, I often play in concert halls, for example. Um, so I really like to navigate this this heterogeneous field. Uh, also because I, I I am a believer of transdisciplinarity. <laughs> I, I I think it's really important, and uh, having having these skills to to work through this, it, um, I find very helpful. Yeah. Of course, there are different practices, yes. And back in the days, I tried to mix them a bit more with the music, but then I thought it was not really working well. But maybe in the future, it, it will be more. Of course, okay, very last thing. Of course, there is a basic love for certain kind of sounds that is shared across my practice and the dub and the other music. So that's a kind of musical imprint. Uh, Marco, uh, I, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit, I, I suspect that you've talked about this um, many times in the past, but I'm very curious about it. And that is the technology of, of ink being injected uh, into layers of our skin and also the kind of mirroring of the amygdala, um, the puncturing mm -hmm. of the skin, but it's just hard not to be um, just how much the, the each of the works you show you showed or little bits of that you showed us are marked by um, the tattoos on your on your body and and you know I, I just find it fascinating the kind of way in which that that those images are shaping also how at least how I, I was experiencing those things and, and I wonder is there something to be said or is there something you haven't said before about that uh, very thing <laughs> mm, yeah no thanks for that um 
That's always a funny topic for me. So I, I, I imagine. I, yeah, because I taught it myself since I'm 16. So that makes it uh, 22 years. And um, of course, when I was 16, I was doing something else. <laughs> and um, I think I, I started thinking about it um, around the time of Ominous, the piece with the red light and the hands. Um, but not because I noticed, because people notice. Because of course, you know, I have my arms tattooed and then I'm moving my arms in the light. Of course, like you're gonna see it. Um, and then I think in, in Corpus Nil, so in the piece all in the dark with the back moving, uh, there I, I use purposely the design of my tattoos to increase the, the at least the optical effect, uh, that the optical illusion that is at the core of the piece. And, um, but yeah, at the same time, it's not that I get tattooed because I want to do performances. <laughs> so <laughs> I, there again, it, it's a bit of a schizophrenic uh, behavior that I have that, yeah, it, it, I just find it, I just find the, the ritual of, of getting tattooed um, important to me as a person. Um, of course, you one could also read the tattooing today as an appropriation of other practices. But that's that's a whole other discourse. I would also agree with that. Um, but I think somehow it it is a sort of body modification that that it it's not too disruptive, at least to me. Um, but it really helps me seeing my body as fluid. Um, it's not the only thing, of course, uh, but it's something that lasts. So you can really have signs on your of your body that that lasts. And then, of course, uh, just the trivial passion for it, and it's it's part of my life since since so long. But I'm not tattooing for the performances, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> Something to look forward to. <laughs> so, so unless uh, there are any last, um... I have a break. Zurich has got a question. Um, you don't need to. Um, thanks. Uh, thank you, Marco. Uh, there were some um, many things already said and asked. I have a very particular question, a little bit geeky, if you want to um, share. Uh, what is the artificial prosthetic skin made of? Ah, okay. <laughs> yeah, so um, I cannot share the whole recipe because that's a, that's a bit of a trade secret. Yeah, but... yeah, yeah, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> But I can tell you something about it, and um, yeah, it, it's first of all, it's 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 nothing uh, very special. But I, I started the research for that, uh, looking at um, uh, um, special effects for movies. Ah, oh, yeah, absolutely. So you can see the materials they use, and and get close to what I'm using. Um, but then, yeah, it's all vegetable uh, based. Organism, so you could eat it. There is uh, coconut oil inside, so it's actually good for your skin. <laughs> and uh, yeah, there is there is no animal uh, substances that was very important for me to do um, because most of the time people use this uh, pig skin or stuff like that for tattoos as well to learn tattoo. And uh, then, yeah, what, what, I, what is my trade secret then is the, the amount of ingredients and, and uh, other substances that, that make it, um, they make its consistency change uh, fairly in a controlled way uh, through three or four months. So that, that took me a while. Um, and then it's, it's nice because also the, the skins, that amygdala does then become another artwork that, that I also exhibit as, as sculptures. And it's nice because you can see the different behaviors of, 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 the, um, of the machine and how they interact with the materiality of, of the substance. So uh, I find that quite interesting. And um, yeah, so it was important to um, create a skin that would not just 
become crumbles after four months, which happened in the in the beginning. Uh, so now I'm quite happy because it maintains a little bit of softness, but it's still too hard for the machine to cut. So you get you get a bit of everything. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. So I think oh, Sarah, go on, go go ahead. I'm trying to unmute myself. Just a tiny one. Well, not really, but the skin, <laughs> back to the skin. The skin is one of the largest sense organs in the body. Have you ever thought of using that in a way as a means of um, engaging with, dialoguing with, whatever you like to call it, the machine? And could, is there anything that could be done with that? Mm. Um, you you mean the, the skin of a living creature or you, or in general you, mm. in in performance? So you've got all mm. you know, you leave your hair on that skin, but the hairs are also on your body, and they surely could. Mm. Just the thought yeah. of it, that as the sense system, sensory so sensing system, if you like. No, totally. It is a very good point. I did not think about it, um, although. With this new project I'm working on deafness, um, I'm going back to very low technology, like low-fi technology, and I'm, I'm I'm building from scratch components of speakers, coils, and stuff like that to explore this with the research group. And uh, of course, the interface there is the skin, mm -hmm. and. Um, and it's really nice to be among other deaf people because we, we all share in different degrees because then every kind of deafness is different. But we do share this sensitivity for, for vibration and, and low frequency sound. And of course, the interface is one of the skin is one of the best interfaces in, in that sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, maybe I will take a bit of inspiration from your thoughts, if you don't mind, <laughs> in this current fun. research. Yeah, yeah because that's pretty much what we are doing yeah, yeah good mm. it's temperature as well it senses temperature and all mm. the all those things that that are very intangible in in the world mm. yeah and also all kind of gut reactions that are also translated through the skin so yeah uh, that's interesting okay mm. that's cool. thank, thank you, you. thank you so, Marco, thank you so much. Uh, it was uh, a tremendous pleasure and provocative, and uh, there was something about the darkness of it and the beauty, but perhaps not in the Holtzian sense of uh, his desperation for beauty. And so thank you for your time. Uh, thank you, Tioma, for the work you have done. And thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, it's um, It really is a pleasure to be um, to have these conversations and for people to to be in them and uh so until next time um i, was, I don't know it sounded like a radio host there um but anyway so um just thanks very much everyone and we're gonna we're gonna quit right there yep. thank you so much for having me thank you thank you <laughs>